I'll introduce myself again. I am Margaret Gingerman, General Secretary of the Bee Farmers Association. And, and today with my colleague, uh, David Rudland, we're going to give you a talk about climbing the beekeeping ladder. That means the transition from being an amateur beekeeper to being able to join the uh, Bee Farmers Association, which is the trade association for professional beekeepers. And we hope at the end of this talk, you will know more about us, but you'll know more about the pitfalls of running a small business in bees. So why are you here? Let's start with a why. Why are we doing it? Is it because you have a developing interest in the subject generally? Is it because you have a passion for honey itself? A passion for bees? Is it because you're developing skills for other reasons, for environmental uh, sustainability reasons or things like that? Or is it just because it's an overgrown hobby and you're not quite sure where to go next? Okay, there could be a myriad of other reasons why you're in this room, but I've covered four of them here. I want you to think about why you are here and why you think that you want to climb this beekeeping ladder, this transition from being an amateur into being a professional. The objectives of our talk today is to give you an, overviewing of, uh, an overview of what uh, bee farming is in the UK itself, um, how different it is from uh, other countries and that, but what it's, the industry is like in this country. We want to deal with issues like swarming, the inspections, requeening, the moving of hives and things like that. And that's why my colleague David is here today because he is an expert in this and he will be able to, to cover those for you. I am here today as a business expert. I'm here to tell you the business pitfalls that you might fall into. If you're climbing the beekeeping ladder, you need to have a knowledge of business. You need to understand some of the problems of running a small business. And you need to take on board the responsibility of running small business. We'll cover that. Obviously, the Bee Farmers Association too has a lot of benefits for being to, to, to members when you're setting up and we will cover those and I'm sure that the benefits of the, the organisation will be something that you in this room will uh, have lots of questions about because that, when I'm standing at my stall out in, in the presentation hall, that is the biggest thing that people come up and ask me about. What are the benefits of being a member of the Bee Farmers Association? And we'll cover that for you and you'll have a lot of questions around it. We're also going to cover, and this is why the, the reason I've asked um, for Ollie and Stuart, our apprentices, to be in the room today, because they are the young face of bee farming, okay? And obviously they're the, the youngest people in the room, but we are going to tell you how we at the Bee Farmers have taken an active approach in building a world-class apprenticeship scheme to, to bring in youngsters into the industry. We're going to tell you about how we work with government to represent the bee farmers' interests, to, to talk about um, uh, Brexit, for instance. We've got to have a voice in these debates. We've got to be there to, to represent the bee farmer at the table, both with government at a regional level, a national level, and uh, an EU level. Indeed, I go to Brussels regularly to represent all you guys, not just the professionals, but the amateurs too, to represent all of them at, in Brussels. We need to be represented there. Bee farming, though, is a devolved function, so we have to be represented in England, in Scotland, and Wales and Northern Ireland. All of those four um, countries have individual pollinator strategies and it's my job to represent you guys at all the, the, those um, uh, forums. Okay, and I'll be talking about that. And then the nitty gritty of how you join. We'll end up with telling you how you go about it and hopefully some of you will decide it's for you. So what is bee farming? To be or not to be? <laughs> it's just beekeeping on a larger scale, okay? That's all it is. It seems as simple as that. But <laughs> it's a lot more complicated than that for the simple reason that you're, you're making a living out of managing livestock. So you are farmers. You will become livestock managers and all the problems that that entails. So not only have you got to contend with the livestock, you've also got to contend with your, the weather, environmental factors, uh, government factors, policy factors, and that all makes a massive difference, but it, it's a much bigger scale than the amateur. And you're wanting to make a living out of it. So making a living in a small business means making profit, okay? 
You've got to understand that if you want to make a living, you've got to be making profit. You've got to derive some of or whole uh, or part of your income from the bees. OK, so you're looking at bees to provide you with a, some part of your living. But it's very different from you keeping bees to bees keeping you. That transition is very different. Now, I didn't think of those words. They are the words of Manly. Yes, a few heads nodding, Manly, OK? He said that many, many years ago. I think it was in the 50s. He said that, you know, keeping bees is one thing. Bees keeping you very different kettle of fish. And, and to the point that most people who are hobbyist beekeepers are prepared to spend money on that hobby rather than to derive an income from that hobby. So th there's, a, there's a big difference between putting money into keeping bees, a few hives, and, and sustaining a lot of hives and still putting money in but not deriving anything in return. And, and that makes a difference. In the UK, we're talking about people with 100 plus really making, uh, making a living out of it, OK? You're talking as you go to the EU and to the States of something completely different. Don't be hoodwinked by reading up about how it works in the States or how it works in Europe. It is very different to beekeeping here. OK, in uh, Europe, the 150 hives that's mentioned on this slide, um, that would be somebody doing it in addition to another job. OK, I have a friend in, in northern France who indeed has 150 hives and he works full time as a lecturer in um, uh, tree keeping or something um, um, at a, a local college. And he finds time to keep 150 hives. That would not be possible in this country. So you may ask why? Yeah. Pay mainly for forage. Yeah. Because in parts of France they have acres and acres and acres of forage. Mm -hmm. So they're planting sunflowers by the mm -hmm. how many acres. We don't have that here in the UK. And they will take thousands of hives into, or hundreds of hives into pollination areas. So it's, it's a little bit different in the UK. We don't have that ability. And some of you will recognise this slide now as um, Dan Basterfield, who uh, is at this event here and is a member of the Bee Farmers. Um, we have about 470 members in this country. Uh, a few years ago, back in uh, 2013, I think it was, we had 200 and something. So we now have 470. So we are a growing body of people. Our voice is getting increasingly loud in the, the uh, marketplace of the bee industry. Majority of our members have around the 300 hives, mm. yes? And how many do you have, David? We're about 250. Yep. Yeah. And we account for about a third of the hives in the UK. So should I jump? Th this man, Tony Harris, who jumped last year from being a, an enthusiastic amateur into being a professional, says it really is important to, when you're making that dramatic increase you can't do it unless you are capable of managing that number of hives. So you have to be honest with yourself and say, I am capable of managing 20 plus hives. OK, and Tony now manages uh, 150 hives and uh, some of you may see him at this event. And his business uh, has developed from a hobby. He is one of that. You remember back to the why slide? Why am I doing it? He was an overgrown hobbyist but he's now a very uh, enthusiastic professional beekeeper um, it, based up in Scotland. And you will see in one of the last issues of our Bee Farmer magazine that he did a rather nice article about uh, how he managed to, to grow. Uh, I think it's also worth pointing out at this point that uh, uh, Margaret's talking here about the business side of it. The other thing you've also got to consider is your health side of it. Can, you, know, we, you might be able to manage 20 colonies, but can you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and shift 60 colonies onto pollination contracts? It is a very physical, heavy job. And unfortunately, <laughs> looking around the room, I have to be careful what I say here, but we're not getting any younger. And it, it's something which you really, really need to take on board is that physically can you cope with the demands of this job? So what is the Bee Farmers Association doing in all this? The Bee Farmers Association can be summed up in three objectives. We want to further the interests of bee farming in the UK generally. That is commercial bee farming, people making a living from bees. We also want to promote the, the maximum national use of the honeybee for pollination on crops. 
for the production of honey, but also to uplift the yield of crops. And there's new research being done, which the bee farmers are taking part in, to show the up um, yields in uh, crops like oilseed rape and various other crops. Mm. And this is really important to us. We maintain the highest standards in production, packing and the selling of honey and other products. I've just put honey on the slide, but it is other products. It, we, we do include all the other things that bee farmers do and we meet the highest standards possible in their production. So you as a person now, you've got to think about how many hives you can physically manage. And David's touched on the, the bad back. I always remember a couple of years ago I went to one of our regional meetings up in the north and every single person who came in came in like this. The meeting was in October. Good harvest that year. They could hardly stand up the guys because the highs were so heavy. But we reckon that one person can manage up to 100 hives themselves. Would you agree, David? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Now you see from the rest of this chart, 200, you need one person absolutely full time, okay? full out on that. It's really interesting. We have one member who says in 1950, a one man could make a living on one ton of honey. He now says one man cannot make a living on five ton of honey. Okay. I can see you all going, wow. Well, that, that's, that's the bottom line, isn't it? You've got to think in those mm. skills. Don't fool yourself into thinking I have a ton of honey that will pay, give me a good living. It won't. It really won't. You've either got to think of something else or get more hives. OK, but the point is you then get up to 250 hives, which Ollie's father has got up to that, that level in Lincolnshire. And you're nodding, Ollie, aren't you? Yeah. That he now needs another person. And indeed, he's very lucky to have Ollie as his, his apprentice, his son as his apprentice. And he can now expand a bit further because he has help. OK, so don't think I could do 250 hives on my own because you can't. You really can't. When you get up to 400 to 1,000, you're talking about staff in the summer, real staff. Now, we've got then, it's not just managing the staff to send them out to do your job like you do, to manage the bees like you manage them. It's also the logistics of running those staff, paying their tax, paying their national insurance. OK, am I painting a picture of a bit of more you're not out with the bees anymore, you're in the office doing a bit of admin at least one day a week, if, more, if not more. Then we go up beyond a thousand. Beyond a thousand you need a team, you need staff. Our uh, biggest bee farmer in the country has 12 staff. Like that, yeah. So, and that would be at, uh, around the 3,000 hives, about 12 staff. Okay, and those staff work in teams, so they're sent out four o'clock in the morning, at dawn in the summer, I can see a few sort of, yes, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. They're all sent out at that time. So you've got to get staff who are willing to come out at f four o'clock in the morning to do that job. And it's all the on costs that go with it. So it's not just staff costs, it's your vehicle costs, your all these other costs you've got to cover before you start even making a profit. So you're going to, you, if it's lashing with rain, you're still paying their wages. As in yeah. any other business. How are we going to earn a living from it? When we first produced this slide for, for our early talks, we had four pieces of the jigsaw in it. And then as the, the talk's been developed, we've added more pieces. There are numerous mm. business models that you could go for. We hone in on honey down the bottom in the corner because everybody thinks when they're first starting, honey is the thing that will bring me a living. I think I've pointed out to you honey isn't necessarily the thing that will bring you a living. You could have bee equipment, like thorns. Thorns are members of the Bee Farmers Association. Bee equipment, okay? Colonies, queens or nukes, you could be selling those, but you might still be doing a bit of honey, but you might decide to hone in on that because you really like uh, queen rearing. I mean, some of you in this room are better quite into that, aren't you? Because of the levels of, yeah, a few <laughs> nods here. Yeah, I can tell. So that you'll be into that. Then there's beeswax. OK, there's a whole industry around beeswax. OK, everything from uh, producing your candles to producing wax on a grand scale for um, film effects. Like uh, if any of you have seen the latest James Bond film, there is a, a, a high speed vehicle goes through a glass window in the film. And that glass window was actually made of wax. 
Okay, so there's all sorts of things you can do with wax, not just candles. Okay, so you think out the box on that one. Oh, and of course, we then move on to cosmetics, which of course, wax or honey, you could use both of those, or propolis, you could use all of those in it. Or, like David, you can move on to the one at the top. <laughs> education, we do a lot of education as a, as a business. Our business model is almost 50% education now, um, both for the amateur sector and the commercial sector. And obviously, we, we're heavily involved with the bee farmers teaching the apprenticeship scheme. So, and, and as Margaret said, it's not just, you don't have to hone in on one aspect. You could multiple aspects. And there are many more than on this jigsaw. Oh, absolutely. We and have I'm, Luke in the room. I was just going to say. He's not in our jigsaw yet. <laughs> so Luke <laughs> produces a, a fantastic new product, Sparkling Mead, new business model. And when thing. Margaret's talking about sort of queens and bees, and everyone does think of honey, but you, know, you may have pollination. We don't have pollination contracts in there, actually, and our, our pollination officer earns most of his and, living from pollination. And the bee farmers, that's one of our mm -hmm. main uh, incomes, if it can be one of our main incomes, is, mm. is pollination. So, you know, these are, these are topic headings, by all means, but you've got to think outside of the box, literally, mm. and think, what else can I do from my bees? Yeah, and you can do a combination of them. You can yeah. fit two or three of them together that appeal to you. We've got to also consider all this in the wider... Um, scope of, of what uh, honey production is like in the world okay and i've put in this slide to show you the, the imports of honey into the eu eu imports 39 percent of the honey in the, the world 39 percent of imports come into europe okay of those 39 percent 35,000 tons of those come in to the uk we go on to EU honey production. These are the, this is extrapolated out to the actual countries as they produce them. You see up here, at the top here, Spain producing its 35,000 tonnes, so it could produce enough honey for us to consume in this country. But you look down at us, we are miles down the list. I think where we are. Over here. <laughs> in that particular year, 2015, 2.8 thousand tonnes. That did not satisfy 14% of domestic consumption in this country. So there is a huge market for honey, but there is a huge market for British honey. Okay, we, there's a huge feeling that British honey is a premium product. You all know this because I bet you have no trouble at all getting rid of your honey. You are entering a small business if you choose to do so that you are going to be very lucky in. There are very few small businesses in this country that can say they can sell every single bit of their product. You could sell every single jar of honey you produce can be sold. There is domestic demand for it. And it's interesting because domestic demand for honey is going up. It's now becoming uh, more in demand and more of a spread than jam which is incredible. More people prefer bread and honey than they do bread and jam now. Okay, so you're entering into an industry where you can sell everything. That is a, a really interesting industry to be in. Most small businesses can't do that. And, and the public want local products. They, mm. There's a, a huge demand for where, where has this product come from? Whether it's, whether it's meat, bread, honey, there's no different. And people want whole, good, wholesome Holidays. products. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, mm. exactly, provenance, yeah. And, and so I think this, as an industry, we are, we are seen to be, through the bee farmers, certainly quite rigorous on the way that we say the product must be managed and maintained, and we have standards that we should expect our members to be long, you know, to adhere to, to maintain that purity. So having said the sort of macro picture of it now, we're going to move over to David talking about the <laughs> actual bees, the bits you guys like. I'll talk about the bit later you don't like, but David will now <laughs> cover the so, bees. So, I mean, obviously, from the point of view of, of honey production or, or looking after stocks of bees, the one thing that uh, we've got to be careful of is our swarms. And uh, certainly from the point of view of, of commercial beekeepers, we obviously have hives, large numbers of hives, often in small spaces or, or in locations. And one of the things that can become a problem is managing this, this, this thorny problem of, of swarms. But hopefully as bee farmers, we, will, we are in a position to uh, use stocks of bees that are less swarmy. 
that we manage on a routine that enables us to, to hopefully prevent too many swarms being lost and being a nuisance to the public. But we need to keep the bees in the box to protect that, to produce the honey. So by being on a commercial basis and understanding the commercial side of things, we hopefully are able to manage our stocks in such a way to produce that honey. And, and uh, this is Ian uh, Wallace, one of the guys down in uh, Quince, Devon. Yeah, Devon. Quince Honey Farm. Just showing that you know, we are very confident with bees. You, are, you will become with one. And you need to know your bees and the temperament of those bees. You need to know the temperament of every hive is because you've got to go in there and manage them and you've got to work quickly and efficiently. And so, you haven't really got time to be collecting swarms no. like this. Fun though it may be. That, that's not an element of our job. We, we've got to keep the bees in the box and working. Mm. We haven't got time to chase around. So you want to find some management technique. You've also got to be able to look at your bees quickly. We haven't got the ability to go and spend an hour at each hive. We've got to get through how many in a day. You know, if we're looking at managing how many hives in a, you know, 100 hives, one person part time. We haven't got time to spend a lot of time at each colony. So, you know, we've got to find ways that we can do this. And some of you already probably do this management of splitting boxes, looking in the two halves to see queen cell formation or whatever. So it is, you will develop techniques. You'll keep strains of bee that possibly aren't swarming or you'll raise bees that aren't swarmy bees and things like that. And in fact, we were talking about that this week on our training course, looking at ways we can actually improve our genetics in order that we can hopefully manage our bees more efficiently, if you like. Um, Requeening, we tend to do this on a massive scale. <laughs> uh, when it's not one queen here or one queen there. And generally, uh, there are a couple of exceptions, but generally most bee farmers use a particular type strain of bee, which gives us the ability to be fairly confident that our stocks are all going to be very similar. We're, we're taking away the variability. If you can standardise, you know when you take the roof off the hive from the hive A or hive B, C, whatever, they're all going to be pretty much the same. If you've got every hive different, you've now got a really long-winded job of dealing with your bees. And you've got to carry so much extra kit. So requeening, we've got people are doing queen rearing as a, as a, a, a source of income. It's their mm -hmm. main line of income. Um, and obviously, you know, we, we're looking for bees that are handleable. We don't want to be walking around in a bee suit all day long, seven days a week, uh, sorry, five days a week, nine to five. <laughs> um, we, we're not after that. We, <laughs> we want to be able to go to our colonies, do the job. We don't want to be fighting the bees. And some of you may know who this is in, the, in this picture here. This is Robert Field. And you'll see, no bother with the bee suit. I went out with him one day, neither of us had our bee suits on, and I took that picture of him. Uh, just He was requeening that day, that's why I yeah. could do it. The other one is Tony Harris, who we touched on earlier, who's a recent uh, uh, bee farmer. Uh, and the other thing which we also do, um, we have a, the, the magazine you've got in front of you, The Bee Farmer. Some of our members are really happy to share experiences and, and, uh, and knowledge. And, and one of the great things about our community, if you like, because it's almost a community, is that we will help each other out. And we'll share ideas and we'll say, this works for me and it might work for you. And um, a, a lot of beekeepers, a lot of the bee farmers are very specialist in areas. And the great thing is we have workshops, we have conferences together, and, and this information is passed on, this is how I do it, oh, that's great, it works for me, it doesn't work for so-and-so. So, so we, we, that is a really important part of the, the industry, I think. And I would also go on and say that sharing expertise, we also share help. Yes. You know, if a member has an, an issue, has a problem, then very often someone, Margaret, yeah. will often get a phone call and say, so-and-so's broken his leg. And the honey's due off, or I've got to shift some hives out of the field because the farmer's going to spray. And with, without exception, I, can, I, I actually <laughs> think without exception, I could be wrong here, but I don't know. I think without exception, a single phone call and usually some, another bee farmer will go and assist and help out. What I usually do is once I get the phone call, I put the pin in the, the, the map and I draw a little circle around it. And I've never had, other than phone, the first person who's been able to offer some sort of help. And last season, we had somebody who did their back in and his wife phoned at lunchtime and said, um, 
He's meant to be moving these uh, hives off a farmer's field. He's got 40 hives to move off this farmer's field. He's been told he's got to get them off by tonight. I had somebody down there by four o'clock that afternoon. And that was the, the, the help that we were able to give with a trailer, with the expertise yeah. to do it. And it is the expertise yeah. that's important. So obviously, um, if you've got lots of colonies, you need to move them around. You can't possibly make a living and, uh, from just having bees in one location. If you're going to try and make money out of honey production or whatever, we're going to need to move our bees around. And this is, um, this is Murray. Murray McGregor, yeah. Yep. This is Murray. So this, this particular operation here up in Scotland, uh, about 3,000, just over 3,000 colonies. You know, we're talking about serious bits of money here. Yeah, uni a fleet of Unimogs. And the ability to drive them. You've, you've either got to be able to drive them yourself, and he has teams, he has to, all those, you see he has four Unimogs, he has to have four drivers with the right uh, licenses to be able to drive those. Yeah. Okay, so you've got to think of that, on that. You think, oh, it might be nice to have a Unimog, but you need a different <laughs> license. <laughs> And you're talking about vast numbers of colonies. You've got to have somewhere to put them. We've also got a uh, Willie Robson, for example, you know, mm -hmm. up in Northumberland. They'll bring in, um, they'll overwinter in certain sites. You, it's just it's to get your head around the number of colonies you've got to be able to move and keep a track on where are they, where are they going to at any one time is really critical. And how you manage those stocks to ensure that when you are doing migratory beekeeping, that the stocks you're taking are fit for purpose. You know, if it's, especially doing something like pollination contract, you know, there is guidelines. Mm -hmm. that those colonies have to be of a standard that the beef, are, the, the grower or whatever is paying for, because it's a paid service. So we have to be able to fulfil those contracts honestly and truthfully. And hives and are inspected We're very to strict on it. Yeah, we, we, we inspect the hives to, to make sure we have a feedback system from the farmer <laughs> to make sure that it's done properly. And if you don't do it properly, you don't get another contract. It's as simple as that. <laughs> This mm -hmm. photograph here really shows once you start becoming professional, the, in, the monetary investment in the business is substantial. I mean, seriously substantial. Forget the Unimogs, you know, look at all these colonies, the staff levels, somewhere to house all this lot. And we'll, there's some slides in a minute coming up. You know, the premises you're working are not your back garden shed. But we also work in some beautiful locations. <laughs> And it can be lonely. If you're, if, you're a, if you're a beekeeper out on the Scottish moors and you've got your hives out there, John, this is John Mellis. And, you know, what a, what a beautiful place to come and work. But, but you're there all day long You've got to like your own conversation. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's a, a serious factor in almost all fields of farming, to, to, to be honest with you. So we like to tell people that. And obviously we have... Um, various uh, entrepreneurs in terms of equipment uh, manufacturer, and a lot of this is homemade uh, lifting apparatus for trying to save backs and uh, an, an ease of movement. But of course, these are really great, they obviously cost a lot of money, but you've also then got to consider if you're using these methods of lifting and shifting your hives, you've got to have somewhere you can actually drive to to unload these bees. There's no point in having all this wonderful equipment if you can't use it. So if you're going down this road of looking at mechanisation, is the application you're going to be using it for <coughs> suitable? So there's a huge amount of groundwork that goes on and field work before you actually get to this stage. But we do find, and all these pictures illustrate it, that bee farmers are, are incredible uh, at inventing things. Almost all these lifting things have been adapted and made by <laughs> bee farmers themselves. And I bet some of you in this room will have made your own little things for, li for lifting in that. And obviously, <laughs> um, liaising with other businesses and other beekeepers. You know, if we're buying in syrup, we buy a tanker at a time to feed colonies. And very often, you know, to get the price, the economy of price, the bee farmers will arrange bulk buying. And um, so, you know, here we've got a tank of syrup coming in. Well, this one bee, bee farmer may not want a whole tank, you know, a whole lorry of syrup. So they'll arrange with other bee farmers somewhere to decant. And, and offload, but they've got to have the premises to be able to do this. You can't just do this on the side of the road. And indeed, in, in some regions, the regional rep will organise the tanker to come. He will have a premises, either his own premises or a place that he will it's negotiate dangerous. with a farmer mm -hmm. in order to, um, to, to offload. So, but you've got to have a big yard to be able to take the, the tanker in the first place. And then we talk about bulk honey production. So rather than putting it into jars, you can just put it into drums and sell it 
uh, in drums and there are a lot of there's a huge demand for drummed honey and it's obviously from your point of view once it's in the drum lid goes on clip goes around sealed goes off somewhere else, your problem gone but how do you lift it onto the the the, uh, <laughs> the so lorry to, the to get it going to to do yes. this. you need to be able to lift those if you decide to go down this th this route you have to have a forklift don't you there's another thing you need, a forklift uh, qualification. You have to have some way of getting on to the no, truck. Design. What does become a problem is that if the haulage company is being paid to come and collect these, they are not going to wait for you to manhandle these onto a lorry. They, mm. No, they won't happen. They, they'll just walk up, they'll drive away. Mm. They have got to go on now. You've got to find some way of getting them on quickly. <laughs> uh. <laughs> And if you're rolling them, they don't like them being rolled. I mean, this is uh, Robert Field's um, set up down in... Uh, Swanage. Swanage. <laughs> Couldn't think where it was for a minute. Um, and, and Robert's now gone the, down the line of in, investing in a huge extraction plant, fully automated. So this will take the boxes, the combs out of the box, put them onto the system, uncap them, uh, load them into the extractor. 72 frames at a time, I think it mm. is. Um, and then it will put the frames back in the original boxes. So everything is contained, so we know that there's some management of disease in this sort of operation. But huge, huge, huge investment. And some of you who went to B-Trade X, not last time, but the time before, will have seen this mm. uh, very machine, because before it was installed at um, Field Honey Farms, they brought it over to show it in pristine condition um, mm. at that show. And uh, I think this will, four tonnes a day? Mm. You're going into this industry uh, with your eyes open to be, a, it has to be profitable otherwise you're not in business. If you don't make a profit, you're not in business, bottom line. So how can we be profitable? Well, certainly efficient handling. As I said <coughs> earlier on, you, know, you, you want colonies to be very similar, so you're going to be able to go through your apiaries in a fairly speedy operation. You're not going to be wasting time looking at different hives. So standardising your... Uh, uh, colonies is important. If you're going to be moving bees around, you can, have you got the equipment to do it? Can you get them onto a trailer? Can you get them onto the vehicles? Is the vehicle four-wheel drive or, or whatever? How high is it? I mean, trailers and, and all sorts of things. They, they're all things you need to consider um, and where, how you're going to do it. And then processing of the produce. How are you going to do that? Are you going to buy a massive great big extraction line or are you going to sit there and, and wind it by hand? So economies of scale, numbers of hives and reduced variability and investment in equipment are all important parts, but that's a financial commitment. And if, if you're going to go to the bank manager and ask for that <laughs> input, you, you've, got to have, you've got to have a business plan that says this is a viable operation. And you'll see here, obviously you've also got to have somewhere to store the equipment afterwards, haven't you? got to have somewhere to store all those supers and somewhere to store those supers safely, dryly, hygienically, all the yeah, rest yeah. of it. And you'll see over here, at what point do you invest in a bottling machine? Or do you sell it all in drums? Do you sell it all in drums? Do you ask your, one of your other colleagues to bottle it all for you? But what is the absolute key to everything is have a proper business plan. This is the boring bit now, isn't it? <laughs> You've got to have processes in your brand. Thank you for yawning, sir. That's absolutely <laughs> terrific. You did that to, 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 to order. But you do have to have a business plan. And all the, these things here, you have to have a proper uh, credit control process. You have to have forecast your sales properly. I know with bees that might sound difficult to do because you don't quite know how much honey you're going to get, do you? But you have to put some figures down so you've got some idea of what your income's going to be. You're going to have to think of ways of controlling your costs and your spending. I don't know if any of you watch Grand Designs, the, um, the architectural program that's on with Kevin McLeod. How often do those people on that program not um, control their costs and their spending? And you hear at the end of the program, the budget went haywire, didn't it? They had to go to the banker mum and dad or something to borrow extra money. That happens so much in small business that they don't control their costs and their spending. And there are ways of controlling your costs and spending, being on good terms with your suppliers, um, even joining an organisation like the bee farmers to, to get a control on it. You've got to have a system for managing that cash. 
bee farmers traditionally do not get their money from banks because people will tell you that you go to the bank and you say I want to set up a bee farm and the guy says to you oh how do you do that I've that's really interesting how do you do that how do how many hives are you going to have and then he says well what are you going to do when they all die and you're thinking uh, don't know um, I'm gonna have empty boxes I'm gonna have to restock and all the rest of it Bank managers don't like that sort of thing. It really is out of the, I don't know if we have any bank managers in the audience, but it really is out of their, their sphere of lending. So it's not a, a, an option to, to a lot of uh, businesses to get money from banks. There are some B businesses that do get money from banks, but it's not a general way to... And, to and also, you can't guarantee a honey crop. And they're going to say, you yeah, what's your return on your 100 highs? And you say, well, two tonne of honey. And they'll say... Oh, that's good. That's guaranteed. I said, well, it depends on the weather. And he, we won't be impressed. But you've got to recognise the warning signs. And of course, to, to you in small business, if you're going to go into small business, there's a great warning sign. Your bees haven't produced any honey that year. You've got to think of something else. You've got to think of a plan if they don't produce honey. So you've got to have a few warning signs in your business plan that says, if I don't get any honey, I will do whatever you're going to do to, you know, I'll spend the, the, the winter going out teaching bee uh, keeping or I'll go out doing this other ways of earning your money that didn't depend on one section of your business so be realistic that's what I'm saying be realistic about the, the, the business ideals this is obviously an interesting slide because most people don't check their bank account on a regular basis at all but once you're in small business it's absolutely critical that you know what's in your bank account on a daily basis people that know that what's in the bank account on a daily basis are much more likely to succeed. Even if it's a bad figure in your, your bank account, don't say it's a bad figure so I'm not going to look. Okay, you've still got to look at it. Think of ways of managing it, okay? So many, many short businesses fail on the short term uh, because of the lack of managing their bank balances, okay? Cash flow critical to a small business. Many, many small businesses, 70% or more in some cases, experience problems with bad payers. That's why in Honey, it's really daft to give lots of credit to anybody, okay? It really is. You, you, why should you do that? Because you don't need to. If they've eaten the product, okay, or sold it on, if you've sold all your product to a farm shop, it's all gone. They're far less likely to pay you than if you've got it there and you're saying, this is a beautiful product, are you going to pay for it? My advice to people selling honey is be very careful when you give credit. It's not necessarily who you give credit to, it's, it's when you give credit. You don't have to give credit. You can say to these shops, no, you can have my honey if you pay me now. It's a really good tip when you're first going into business. Don't give too much credit. Okay. I've included this slide so that you can really read it in your own time, about 10 ways to include avoid this cash flow crisis because the cash flow crisis is the thing that sees you out when you just start sees you off just when you're starting in business okay and there are ways here that you can stop that regularly facing up to what is in your bank or wasn't what isn't in the bank i've already mentioned that the number of people that start in b businesses who don't see the importance of sending out their invoices on time is amazing absolutely amazes me how people don't understand that if you don't send in an, out an invoice how are people going to pay you and then once you people have eaten your product or drunk your product they're not going to pay for it are they and you're too tired mm. to send the invoice out that's i think that's half of the problem you know, you're up at four o'clock in the morning and you go to bed or well, you know you come in from the field at 10 o'clock at night the last thing you do is sit down and do your invoices and if you've got a customer who is a good payer and always pays you on the 24th of the month, let's say, pay attention to that. Because the day he doesn't pay you on the 24th of the month, you be, should be chasing him on the 25th because that might indicate that he has a cash problem. Now, if you go to him on the 25th, he might pay you. You go to him on the 30th he might have paid lots of other people before you so if he pays regularly on that day pay attention to it and make sure if, if he misses it you're on him but nicely on him I'm not saying go down and you know kneecap him because you've, <laughs> he hasn't paid you I'm saying be nice chase it properly but do notice that because it's really important um, 
good terms with the bank, that obviously goes without saying. You've got to be aware of their tax days, your rent days, um, the days that your suppliers, because you, you don't give any credit, but you want to get as much credit as possible out of everybody else. Okay, that's the, the way we do business, really. You try and get as much credit out of everybody, but pay attention to when you pay them. The ones of you who are familiar with um, reading business biographies will know that in um, Richard Branson's biography, um, the first one he wrote, um, he says that he never paid a bill until somebody chased him for it. Quite a good way to keep the cash in your bank, isn't it? <laughs> I've, I've, always, I've always gone on that. I thought that was quite good if he can make a lot of money out of that. But it's, it's quite a good idea. You know, pay, pay people when they chase you, but don't let big bills build up. And as I say, right at the bottom there, don't give credit. The one above, though, consider funding options. A lot of people, when they first start in bee farming, come to me and say they want grants. OK, there are grants in certain areas, and it's something the bee farmers do look at you for. But you can't rely on grants. You really can't. You've got to have a business model that isn't based on the idea that you've had some sort of grant. And I mean, we've sort of alluded to this already, you know, in, the, in that very first or second slide, we were looking at the six, six different options. And I think the gentleman at the back was saying, well, what happens in the winter? You know, you're only keeping bees in the summer, but you need to generate an income through, if, you're, if this is going to be your sole income, you know, what else can you do to generate income? Well, Chainbridge have got a, a visitor centre, so Quince Honey Farm. So that's another stream they look at. They look at other products. So they're not just relying on honey, there are other as aspects of their business which together make it an all-year product. And these are two businesses that we actually recommend our members go and see because they are really good at diversification and they've really, all our members welcome other members, so they would actually welcome you to go and see their, their, mm -hmm. their businesses. And they've both tackled their visitor centres very, very differently really interesting to go and see how they do visitor centres and from both of the, visiting both of these farms you will learn an awful lot about bees themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So how about selling in jars then? That's a good idea. Uh, I know Murray McGregor says that selling in jars is an ego trip <laughs> and I've always remembered that because I actually think I love my label. Brand your business. You get brand loyalty. <clears throat> Logos. Really important that when you start in business that you get your, yourself placed and you know, your label design is you, that's the window of your business, that's what people see, that's what people get to know. And if you're going out to, to um, sell in a, a farm shop and the farm shop says why don't you come down and uh, put your honey out so that uh, um, it's, uh, you've designed the, the outlay, the, the layout of how you're going to, to, to sell it. Think of something like this, this guy here John Mellis um, thought of putting um, glass tiers, a bit like some of the exhibits in the hall today. Glass tiers with the honey um, sh sh sort of showcased on it. If you're given the opportunity to go and display your stuff in, at, at um, anywhere like a farm shop, this is the sort of thing you should be thinking of. Market stalls, do any of you do a market stall? You have to enjoy engaging with the public. <laughs> Don't do a market stall if you don't like the public. <laughs> really don't. And as we say to people who run market stalls, we say try to buy. Do think of um, going out and letting people try. However, when you do that, you've got to think of the logistics of that, you know, double dipping and all the rest of it, and that is an issue to you. You've got to have a proper system. You don't want people just coming to your stall just eating and not buying. We're out there to sell. So if people aren't buying, you're not doing the, your tasters right. And, and the okay. thing with tasters or, or these events is that A, you get known in the air, but if you've got two jars with lids on, on the table, they're both the same. It's only by letting people taste them that you, mm. they like that. Because the number of people who say, oh, I don't like honey, it's too sweet. <laughs> mm. I've put this in, this is Roy Taylor, a new uh, member of uh, our association. He's been in the bee farming just a couple of years and he went for a new beginning. And we did, indeed did a big article on him on a, in our magazine, which I'd, I'm hoping that you, you'll be able to get a copy of and be able to see this. But he, that's why he started. And if that's what you're looking for, this is what he did. Um, 
This is his, his setup, how he, he um, did a small honey room in that. But you've got to think of that. You've got to have a place to extract. You've got to have a place to have a honey room. Um, you've got to have a place to store your supers and that. And that's how he went about it. And I just thought it was interesting to show you somebody who'd literally just gone into the business in the last couple of years. <laughs> Here is Luke. Luke, would you like to say something about... Uh, yeah, well, your... um, so we set up Northumberland uh, Honey Company, uh, started out producing honey and then again with that jigsaw we branched out into doing mead um, but wanted to do something a little bit different again. So we produce a sparkling mead in the champagne method. So it's you know, a value added product, uh, it's got a unique selling point. Um, but one thing that I would say starting out, whatever you decide to do, it's really important to look at the route to market, which is what we found to be really important because it's no good producing all of this stuff, you've got to sell it. Even though honey, you know, you can sell any day of the week, you still need to know where it's going to go. Um, and as uh, Margaret said about the you know, cash flow, needs to, you know, you need to be very, very friendly with Excel and, and doing that. So we've been on a bit of a learning curve the past couple of years um, with that. And we're getting to a point where, you know, we've obviously invested huge amounts into it. Um, Branding's really important, but really it's kind of uh, coming back now. We're getting repeat custom from that. Um, and at the end of the day, we, we've had a very good experience over the couple of years with the Bee Farmers Association helping us out, you know, being able to get us out in front of the public and all of the benefits that they'll talk about as well. Um, but yeah, we've, we've uh, diversified slightly, running around 100, 150 colonies of bees and it's very, very hard work, but, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions yeah. that you've got as, you know, you go through the day really brilliant well look will be with us for a little while and then yeah. afterwards we'll all go to his stand and have a little yeah. tipple <laughs> <laughs> i cannot cover this without covering the stresses stresses of small business are incredible the working alone we've already showed you with the slide of john mellis on the, the beautiful hillside how could you be lonely if you were doing in that beautiful setting well you can be lonely you've got to like the the sound of your own voice an awful lot of beef farmers feel undervalued because they have difficult routes to market and uh, uh, difficult uh, difficulties uh, accessing money and things like that. You worry about the health of your livestock. You really do. People are passionate about the health of their bees. And I find people phone me up and say, really upset because they've got chronic bee paralysis virus or things like that. And, you know, the, it, it does affect you. The greatest stress revolves around the finances in your, your, your business. And some of the biggest calls I get are to do with the financing and the debt. And that leads you on to why did you get that? It's often the bad harvest or the burden of paperwork. We have the logo on the bottom there, Farm Community Network. I was getting several calls about this saying, uh, what uh, could I help in this? So we teamed up with a Farm Community Network who provide um, assistance for farmers of all sorts who have worries and it's been a great thing from the bee farmers point of view that we can offer this help to people and when you're just setting out you perhaps won't see that but this is a an option open to all of people who join to take part in the farm community network if you have troubles they're just listeners but they're farming people who are listening to you it's not um, you know, like phoning the Samaritans or something like that. It's phoning somebody who understands farming, will understand your problems. It's a, it's a great that they've teamed up with us and they do this complete, it's a complete voluntary service. They don't charge anyone anything for it. Okay, on to nice things now. <laughs> nice things, one of the nice things we do at the Bee Farm is we go on foreign trips. They're really popular because you learn so much from going abroad. In recent years, we've been to Spain, Germany, Sweden. We're going to Denmark in, in, in March, okay, to, to uh, focus in on queen rearing and queen breeding. The trips are interesting from a point of view of being friendly within the bee farmers. The bee farmers get on quite well together as, as groups anyway, but we learn different things. And I put this slide in because isn't that an amazing way of catching a swarm? He hangs it up in the tree. And then when the swarm has, um, this is a, a crown board, hangs it up in the tree. When the swarm has gone on it, he just lowers it into a, a box. Incredible. Mm. You know, and that was a German guy that, that, that showed us this. You'll see, put these in to show the different ways of um, keeping the hives, a different type of farm shop, which is interesting. 
One of the things we learnt in Germany, which we no see nowhere in this country, is a mobile market stall. This guy drives his market stall round to all the various markets every week. Isn't that incredible? It's actually heated and everything, so that in the winter it's warm, and he just opens it up like a chip van and sells his honey off it. We've got nothing like that in this country. So it was really interesting to see it. The one in the middle, the girl there, she's 29 uh, now, that girl. She's branded her van with her own picture on it. Can you see that? You see she's branded the van with her own picture on, on the, the, the side of it. Incredible bit of um, uh, self-publicising, but something that you know, we don't think about in this country. And she's got her B picture on there in the front. And then the last picture here is um, uh, the chap showing how quiet his bees are. None of us had suits on there. Okay. And, and the, the great thing about going to some of the, some of the other countries is the legislation, how the legislation changes in different countries and, and the requirements. And mm. indeed, when we went to the Spanish one, when they were selling their honey, they had protected regions. Mm. So they, they had, the honey had to come from this particular region and it was tested and it, there was mm. organic honeys and they had to sort of pass certain criteria. The use of uh, pesticides, it, it was so strictly legislated. And, you know, we think we have it tough in this country sometimes, but boy, the hoops they had to jump through. But when we went to Spain also, we went to the, their National Bee Unit. And at their National Bee Unit, they had extraction facilities that yeah. local guys could go along and use the extraction facilities. We've got nothing like that in this country. It was really interesting, though, wasn't it? it? Was that, very, uh, yeah. uh, you know, that they could get themselves together in a cooperative to do this. So, so we learn a lot from going to the foreign trips, and they're very popular with our members, OK? And a lot of people, that's one of the reasons they want to join. There are lots of other reasons. I've listed some of them here. Information and support. I think I've covered the fact that we are a very supportive organisation. OK? You, we do have specialist insurance, and that's another thing that people like to, to um, uh, come and talk to us about. It's part of your, your membership fee. We have specialist experts who can talk to you about that if, if that's a particular thing you're interested in. We have sales, uh, BFA sales department that uh, um, uh, co coordinates bulk sales and various things from jars to appy melters and th things like that gets it together. But we've now just in the last month teamed up with AF Affinity where they are a purchasing farming group that some of you may have heard of. We've d done a tie up with them and they can source almost anything for you but you've got to be a bee farmer to get an account with them okay you get the journal i've given you all a free copy of the journal and um, you'll notice it is the most up-to-date one whereas if you come to the stall earlier as some of you did you get a one that's a little bit further back so i saved all the nice ones for <laughs> you guys um your yearbook the yearbook's really interesting because it gives you a list of all the members and that you can contact yourself. It also gives you a list of product suppliers and things like, like that. It's, it's quite popular to still have the yearbook. Uh, the networking. The networking is uh, very interesting. We have regional meetings and we have five regions and in each of those regions, we have two regional meetings a year organized by the members for the members. And the members decide the agenda. The members decide uh, um, what's fed back to, to, to the, the main board and what they want us to consider. So we do listen to the, the members at, at grassroots. And because we're an organisation of over only 470-odd people, we can listen to each individual, and we really do our best to do that. We have training events, which yeah, David we, often runs. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we have training events all over the place, don't we? And we do. We, we run tr training events. We have an annual conference, um, and some sort of annual meeting. We've been teaming up in recent years with uh, B Trade, Tradex to do it. Um, there'll be a, a something organised during the day specifically for bee farmers, usually an overnight, um, and something probably the next day. The last two years, we've also organised as part of that annual offering, we've um, organised a farm open day, hugely popular, at both the, the events we've had, the first one in Northamptonshire and the second one up in North Yorkshire, both of them attracted in excess of a third of our membership turned up. That's got to say to you guys that we're offering what 
the bee farmers seem to want. And that is the opportunity to go to the bee farm and root around for the whole day, warts and all. Real privilege to go and see how other businesses are, are operating. In small business, that's something that's an absolute rarity, going and actually digging around and seeing how other people operate. And they're really, generally, they're really open. Yeah. Genuinely, they are really open and give advice. Now, the other things, uh, we're going to cover pollination contracts in a minute or two. We're covering the apprenticeship scheme in a minute or two. Uh, we have the beekeepers quarterly, it goes to members, uh, some of you may get that anyway, you know that's the Northern Bee Books one that comes out to you. We have DASH. Yeah, DASH. Does anybody know DASH? Heard of DASH? Yeah, Disease Accreditation Scheme. So um, it's, uh, it was decided uh, to become professional um, and to manage our own problems, if you like, of particular notifiable diseases, AFB, EFB, um, and so after suitable training and a, a, a qualification assessment, the B file can become accredited to the scheme whereby you manage your own notifiable diseases. It saves the B unit having to come out and interfere with the running of your business. So you take control of it. We do have uh, experts that will deal with all insurance queries, but we do offer uh, the whole gambit of insurance through a broker. The, the other thing which is on the board I just noticed, we have an access to buying vehicles. Yes, um, we have that now through rate. AF Affinity, but we also do uh, a couple of deals with, I think it's Toyota and Ford at the moment. Yeah. Pollination. We, we have a, there's a photograph of a gentleman a couple of slides back, Alan Hart. He, he's the pollination secretary for the bee farmers. Uh, growers contact the, beef, the, the, national, the um, Bee Farmers Association <coughs> and say that I've got a crop I need pollination for. Alan is the expert, he gives them advice on the number of hives, density of uh, stocking and things like that. The bee farmer is put in contact with the grower and, and supplies the hives. The great thing is, from the point of view of a bee farmer, is that you are paid by the bee farmers at the completion of the contract, not by the grower. It's down to the pollination secretary to get the money in for the bee farmers association. So you are assured your money. And you know exactly when you're getting it. And how much? <laughs> how much when you're getting it? Um, it's it's a great uh, <laughs> it's a great scheme. Those who haven't done it before, it's a huge learning curve. The first year you do it, <laughs> I've asked David to particularly speak on this because he did it first uh, for oh, a couple of years ago, a few <laughs> yes. years ago, and I learned two really important, well, three important things. The first thing is when you first go out in the morning, you're normally delivering your bees at silly o'clock in the morning, and you turn up at the farm gate, and he says, "Follow me. I'll show you where I want the hives." Two here. Jump in, two here. Four weeks later, you go back to collect your hives. Um, where are they? Because you didn't take note of which hedgerow you put them under. And he's not coming back with you because he's still in bed. Second thing was, you need a vehicle suitable for the, the terrain, which you, we now have. And the third thing was, they give you 48 hours notice to put your bees in and 24 hours notice to take your bees out. That's part of the contract and uh, because they're going to go and spray. And if you don't take your bees out, they're going to spray anyway. Uh, so you go and pick your hives up and then you realise just how much honey they collected. And they were really light when you put them in and now you can't lift them. And you, it's a massive <laughs> learning curve which you learn in your first year. <laughs> so it, once you've got the scheme under your belt and you do it a year in, year out, you have a system, a routine and it works really well. You now plot where you put your... Your hives. Yes, <laughs> and you take somebody with you to collect the hives because David went on his own to collect the hives. And uh, and I also, killed him. I also <laughs> fell down. I didn't personally. My vehicle fell down a, a very soft spot of ground. I had to phone the bee farmer up, uh, the uh, grower up, at uh, four in the morning and say, "I'm stuck in the middle of your orchard." And he was actually quite amenable. He came out and pulled me out. But th they're all little sort of things you have to deal but with. But things you've got to think <coughs> of, aren't they? <laughs> yes. Now. Here's the reason for Ollie and Stuart being in the room. As a bee farmer member, you would be entitled to take part in the bee farming apprenticeship scheme, to have an apprentice. Our two apprentices here, Ollie and Stuart, um, are part of that scheme. The reason we set up that scheme, just over three years ago now, the reason we set it up was because the average age of the bee farmer in this country was 66, okay? Something had to be done about it, the <laughs> average. Something had to be done about it. We had to find a way of aging bee farmers being able to sell their businesses. We had to find a way of 
providing continuity for um, existing businesses to hand on to, to their youngsters. There wasn't a formal way that they could hand them on to their youngsters. There was no formal way that the youngsters could learn. And indeed, um, you're a fourth generation uh, bee, uh, bee farmer, aren't you, you Ollie? So when his um, great-grandfather handed on to his grandfather, I, I would imagine that it was quite in the psyche of the, the way of the land that you always worked with your father, OK? Then when your dad learnt, possibly a bit more difficult than that. But now Ollie's learned. He wants a, a proper structured course to learn by, proper transferable skills, and skills have changed. These six that you guys will, will recognise, and hopefully you'll be there in a, a couple of years' time, this, these six people are the first people to, to graduate under our scheme. They graduated about two weeks ago, and they range in age from 19, and this lad here started at uh, 16, Indeed, we had to get special permission for him to leave school to take part in, in the, the scheme. Uh, and they range from, from, he's 19 now, right up to 27, I think yeah. it is. Um, and in amongst that lot, they all passed, this is our first intake of six, they all passed, two of them passed with distinction. We were very proud of this. These are some of the sessions that yeah. uh, David runs. David runs the uh, delivery of the apprenticeship scheme. So. Because each bee farm in the UK operates on a very different system, very different uh, scheme, so some are honey producers, some are uh, queen rearers or whatever, and they have different business models, it was important for these future beekeepers to actually have a good sound knowledge of the broad spectrum of the industry. And so that, that's part of the reason why the apprenticeship scheme sort of came about to actually try and standardise and give more scope for development and future of the business. And so. Um, we drew up a framework which uh, is a very comprehensive framework and you'll see some of the, the, the content of it in a moment. But there, there is practical aspects of the beekeeping so we actually get to handle bees because some bee farms only use one particular type of hive, some use a different type of hive, some have this system of doing that and some have that system of doing it. And if you stay with one business you only learn that, that method, method of working. By coming on the apprenticeship scheme these future bee farmers are learning the industry, the industry standards, what the industry expects of them, what the industry will get from people employing these people in the future. So we cover everything. Sometimes we're looking at food hygiene or we're looking at disease and we look at barrier management. You know, they, they actually take part, it's, it's live and they, and they work within it. This, this first cohort, they were, all, they were all sons or daughters with the exception of one of bee farmers. And we stood them around a the hive and all six of them had different views on what they should be doing, what they were looking at. Some stand at one position, some have their hives warm way, cold way, some only use 14 by 12, some only use Langstroth. You, your, your Dayton, your pl plastic Dayton, wooden nationals. And indeed some of these youngsters had not actually been allowed to open the bees because Dad had always done it for them. And you puff the smoke when I say. It was a real experience <laughs> for them, wasn't it? It was an experience for us as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so here we've got microscope using microscopes. Uh, so we do microscopy, we look at sort of genetics, we look at all sorts of bits and pieces in, and we have the facilities to do that. This, this particular photograph here is quite interesting because this, this uh, girl, Hannah, was working on, in London and was keeping bee, or the business model was they had bees on roofs. So this individual had to also take working at heights certificate, uh, health and state, the, it, you know, the implications are immense but we cover all of this in the, the course so that they are safe workers. And it's also worth saying that Hannah up there in the, the corner is, has been mentioned in Parliament twice. It's amazing we, for yes. a small scheme like ours to have a couple of mentions in Parliament, it's quite good. Yeah, so absolutely, quite really it. important. And uh, this is uh, Rebecca and Tim um, at the unveiling, if you like, of uh, Robert's new extraction plant. So, <laughs> yeah. so what do they learn? This is, this is the, if you like, the framework. This is the, the course material. So obviously we look at an introduction to beekeeping because <laughs> the idea is that people will be coming into, in fact, like Stuart is coming into the industry from a non-beekeeping background. I mean, Ollie is from a beekeeping family. So, you know, what is beekeeping? What we're we going through today? You know, what is expected of the industry? We do a lot of microscop uh, microscopy work so they can look at bee diseases, 
Uh, we look at strains and races of bee. Um, we, it's important they know what, how bees function, and so we do a lot of dissection for that purpose so they can identify parts. We do obviously a huge amount of disease. Um, pest management. We look at nutrition and, and the importance of the appropriate nutrition for our bees for different times of the year for different purposes. So if you were looking at queen rearing, for example, we, that's really important. Botany and forage sources. Obviously, yeah, we're bee farmers. We want, we want to make honey. It's really important that we know what our bees are going to go and forage on. Are they going to survive? So that is really important. We as bee farmers need to know uh, that kind of thing. Bee, uh, queen rearing and stock improvement. We look at management techniques through the season. We look at processing of beeswax. You know, it's a really, really valuable commodity. Pound for pound, it's more valuable than honey. A lot more valuable than honey. Um, we look at uh, how we can use this beeswax in the trade and uh, the modern world. Bottling, uh, presentation, <coughs> equipment cleaning, um, and recovery of the various products, the byproducts. Carpentry skills, so we've also got to build the hive sometimes or nail them together or repair them or just push plastic bits together, and they would change. But as important, you know, the idea is at the end of this apprenticeship, they are able, hopefully, to be able to run a small business. They should be, at the end of their three years, they should be able to probably go out with some kind of financial backing and actually start a business. So we look at setting up a business. What is actually required in running a business? Finance. And it, going back to that setting up a business, in fact, one of the cohort A students, they wanted to increase the profitability and diversity of their business. And their, the father actually said to his son, look, come up with a, a business plan for your idea. Because this, this lad wanted to develop um, wax products. And, and they actually came up with a, a, a plan, a business model, of how that business, if you went down that road of producing the wax, how it would impact on their main business and would it be of benefit to them. So through using the information they learned on business modelling in the apprenticeship scheme, that was, that's what they did and he actually now is running that as a sideline in the business to in, in, improve their business. Business structures, marketing, first aid, really important, we do a little bit of first aid, health and safety, which is my topic, <laughs> uh, um, and uh, food hygiene. Um, so you can see that they actually cover a really broad spectrum of subjects and this is over a three year period. And they're all transferable skills, that's what we, we, we are giving them, transferable skills so that they could go and work in another small business. Okay, and we've been trying to say to you today that small business skills are really important. They won't just be relevant to running a bee business, they're running Absolutely. any any small business. Yeah. And this is the presentation of the certificates at the uh, first cohort and their trainers there and each uh, apprentice works full-time with a bee farmer for three years and they, they are released onto the block release training where they get the classroom side that they can't necessarily do in the field so all their host trainers are here along with the Lord Mayor of London who presented the certificates and I had to put this one in for Ollie this article that appeared in the Lincolnshire Echo made it out that Ollie was the Batman of the, the bee world, saving the bees. I thought that was such a good piece. <laughs> but there again, we've got... The apprenticeships is really good publicity for us. You'll see that we've had this article in one of the farmers um, magazines this week because Becky's one of our ones just to have qualified. And, um, you know, they've done a really nice piece about how, how she qualified. This is relevant to you today because none of this would be possible without our sponsors. It, they really it wouldn't. Our major sponsor is Rouse Honey, who you all heard of Rouse Honey. They put a huge amount into this uh, to bring up uh, the standard of bee farming in the country. Okay, so they do support us in a huge way. The frameworks that David was talking about, uh, the complication of them was drawn up for us by City and Guilds with the help of a, an ancient livery company, the uh, Worshipful Company of Wax Chandlers, of which I'm a proud member of the a liveryman of the, the, the Wax Chandlers. They are hugely supportive of, of us in the industry. And you'll know that they're supporters of this whole honey show because we are a sponsor of the honey show. So you, you, the, the Wax Chandlers put a huge amount back into the, the bee industry of this country. 
put CAS Business School in because they did a study to see if we were providing a world-class apprenticeship scheme and they did a survey as to what made a world-class apprenticeship scheme. Indeed, when they went out to the rest of the world, they found that very few countries in the rest of the world actually had an apprenticeship scheme. But they gleaned all the various bits of information about training and everything, came up with a criteria, and our one ticked almost all the boxes before we started. But the boxes it didn't tick, we managed to tick. And then the livery companies stood by us with the livery companies uh, apprenticeship scheme, a scheme to bring uh, 52 youngsters into rural crafts and we called uh, bee farming in this context a rural craft and were able to to piggyback on on that scheme and that's how part of the reason we've been so successful sheriffs are here today they have kindly given every apprentice a, a free suit haven't they every apprentice has been given given a suit is that's wonderful for a small business like sheriffs it's huge amount of support for us we're very um, uh, grateful to them for doing that. Freedom Brewery's in there because one of our second year apprentices went out and got our own um, uh, sponsor, Freedom Brewery, a local brewery company who have now asked her to look after the hives at the brewery and the honey from those hives is used um, to do their honey beer. Okay, and I don't know if any of you sell your honey to, to local breweries to, to make honey beer, but that is an avenue for you. Honey beer is becoming a, an increasingly sought after uh, beer and therefore it, it is an, an a, a option to sell honey to, to them. The Bee Farmers Association is the voice of professional beekeeping. Okay, so if you want to be a professional beekeeper, we like you to know that you have a voice. You have a voice with government. You have a voice at EU level, at national government levels and at an organisation called COMBA which if you haven't heard of it is the Council of Beekeeping Associations in this country. It includes all the associations, but we at the Bee Farmers take an active part in that and we really believe that we should be all talking together. All the associations should be talking together and that's our forum to do it. We have been very actively involved in all the national pollination strategies in the UK. We're the only bee organisation that has been actively involved in all of them. England has a uh, National Pollinator Strategy, Scotland has one, Wales has one and Northern Ireland have one. And as bees need no, no boundaries, it is only right that a UK uh, beekeeping organisation like ours should be involved in every one of those and we represent you at all of those. I travel uh, in my work to represent our members, I travel right down from Redruth to Inverness, from Aberystwyth to Norwich. So all over the country and if there are uh, meetings we have to attend and we think that we should have a voice at, I or one of my colleagues is there. For such a small organisation, 470 members, we have a huge presence. Our, our members are really quite proud of the, the loud voice we have at, at these forums. And indeed, as I said to you at one point earlier, I go to Brussels for not just for the bee farmers, funnily enough, for the whole of the, the UK's bee organisations. And we have quite a loud voice there. I'm not shy about saying what we need in the UK. We secured funding from uh, the uh, DEFRA, which is uh, worth drawing your attention to because, of course, a lot of uh, uh, bee organisations have funding from DEFRA. Ours is spent, as you will see, we spend a, a good proportion of it on the um, apprenticeship scheme, the, the BFA Rouse apprenticeship scheme. Uh, we send, spend a bit of it on DASH, a bit of it on uh, web resources for apprentices. All apprenticeship schemes have to have a web resource. They have to enter their um, uh, work onto an e-learning platform. And that's right, because that's the modern world, isn't it? That's how we spend our money. Our corporate image is in our uh, Bee Farmer magazine, which is produced six times a year. And that is one of the really popular things about uh, joining the Bee Farmers Association. You get the Bee Farmer magazine, which is not just any ordinary bee magazine. It is a <coughs> bee magazine plus. It talks about bees in business. And that's why you're here today. You want to be in business with your bees. And that's what our magazine covers. The articles are very much geared towards what your needs are, to, geared towards giving you the information about uh, finances of businesses and things like that. Uh, membership of the Bee Farmers Association is £200 a year, but I think I've tried to show you £200 is a very good value for, for, for your membership. I am the General Secretary 
Alex Ellis is the uh, administration and membership chap who will deal with all your membership queries.